Hey, listen, this is where the magic happens. This is my favorite part of the, the service because we get to talk about Jesus, we get to talk about faith, and we get to talk about the mysteries of the universe. You know, there's nothing that will impact your life more deeply, more richer than your understanding of God, your understanding of your world around you, and your understanding of Jesus. And so it, it is a pleasure to be with you uh, here today. And so if you're here right now and you are, don't have any faith in Jesus, you're maybe on your way to God, maybe you're an atheist, maybe you come from another background and you're just checking things out, how amazing is it for you to come here? And I think we're just going to give you a round of applause. Can we give them a round of applause for coming to here? It's a big church. It's easy to be intimidated. But you know what? We're praying for you. We love you. And we hope by the end of this, this uh, service that you would sense God's uh, pursuit of you and that you would take a step forward. So, uh, so glad you can, can make it. And like mentioned before, uh, my name is Matthew, and I'm in student ministries here. I'm the youth guy. I know you're, you thought about that, and uh, <laughs> you, you heard that and looked at my gray hair and went, what happened? You have no idea. Can you play, pray for me, please? Pretty sure it's just genetics, but you can pray, pray for me anyways. And I, I love youth ministry. Youth ministry is such an area where I uh, learn. So a place where I, I see people grow in their faith development and uh, I see certain, uh, certain things that they believe in and how they act and the trajectories in which they take. And you'd be, often how, uh, you'd be surprised how often the same story is repeated. So oftentimes when, I come, come on these, uh, when I'm on the stage here, I'm presenting to you things that, that uh, I've seen sort of not really worked out in the youth in the youth aspect. And we, we found out, and someone had said this before, that if you don't kill the dragon when it's small, it's gonna come back for you when it's bigger. So we gotta kill the dragon when it's small so we can deal with it, uh, so we can deal with it right then and right there. And what we're gonna deal with today is the fundamental thing about the Christian mindset, and that is biblical belief. Biblical belief. You think you believe in God, okay, let's test that. And here is my thesis that biblical belief to believe in God is to trust in relationship and obedience. Belief in God is trust, relationship, and obedience. I became a Christian in, in grade 10. I was in youth ministry, and uh, someone witnessed to me, and I encountered God in a really powerful way. I came to Church of the Rock, and I gave my heart to Jesus right there, right in the middle section, second row. That's where I gave my heart to Jesus, and I learned how to believe in him. I learned how to trust him, and if you were to ask me if I believed in God, I'd say, oh yeah, of course I do, but when you, when you examined my trust in God, you'd find some, an, a different thing entirely. And so we're going to talk about first, trust. Don't you find it hard to, to, to find trust amongst us? It's a, it's a hard commodity to come by. Do you remember when you could trust the news media? Wasn't that great? Now it seems like they have a little bit of a bias. I don't know about you. Remember when you could trust Amazon reviews? Those were, that was a good time as well. Oh, man. You know, I went into a superstore the other day to buy some authentic Canadian maple syrup. And there, and there was all these different maple syrups. I'm like, oh, this one looks great. I pick it up. I look underneath. Guess what it says? Made in China. M made in Taiwan. <laughs> Is there no place that's sacred? Where do we find trust? You know, you can't trust an umbrella. They're way too shady. <laughs> you know, you can't trust a flight of stairs. They're always up to something. And you definitely cannot trust test results that come from a zoo. Too many cheetahs. <laughs> Where do we go to find trust? Well, let's look into our Bibles to figure out this whole thing in belief and trust. If you have your Bible with you, we're going into Mark 9, verse 20 to 24. And you can follow on screen. If you uh, have your phone with you, you can go there too. And as you're doing that, I'll give you, I'll set up the scene for you. And we're jumping into Jesus' life. The part in his life is where he's known by everyone. He's delivered people from, from demons. He's, uh, he's raised the dead. He's, uh, he's, done so, he's spoken with authority. There's nothing that this Jesus guy can't do. And everyone knows about it. So he's popular, but there's also a lot of opposition. 
And in this time in Mark 9, we see that a, a, a father is bringing his son who, has, uh, who has, a, a, has a demon and is trying to get his disciples to, uh, to deliver this, this, this thing. And it doesn't seem to be working, so they bring it to Jesus because Jesus can do anything. Okay, So here it is, Mark 9, verse 20. It says, so they brought the boy, which we're talking about. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. And he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. It's pretty intense. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. Now, this next verse, guys, is emblematic to, to the faith journey. This is what we cry out in our hearts, whether we know it or not. And I want this to ring in your head for the next little while. This is what the Father says. Verse 24 says, The Father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When we say that we believe God, there's... there's it's not binary. There's, a, there's a, something that we need to grow in is, is belief. And the Greek word belief that is coming here is pastuo. Pastuo, it means to trust. It means to put your full weight upon it. The classic example is if you sit down in a chair, you trust your chair. You pastuo you ch your chair. You know, you know ch churches used to have wooden pews. Now they have comfortable chairs, you know, like thank the Lord for church innovation, right? We, we trust in these chairs. You put your weight in it. You rely on it to do what, it's, what it seems to do. And, but here's the thing. What happens if you went to a garden party and someone offered you a chair that looked like this? Would you trust that chair? Would you sit down in that chair? Anyone would sit down in that chair? Anybody? <laughs> I see that hand. Okay, so you wouldn't, sit, you wouldn't trust in that chair. Maybe you're a, a person who likes, a, likes candy. You've got a sweet tooth. You're going to the grocery store, and you, you realize there's a side hustle happening on the side of the road, and there seems to be a bargain. And you go to this thing on the side of the road. It says, free candy. <laughs> seems legit to me. Okay, so you, maybe you don't, tr you don't trust that, but you go into the store and then you want to buy yourself a, a bag of chips and then you find yourself an authentic bag of Ditos. <laughs> Ditos. Would you trust this? I mean, I'm in youth ministry. You, d you dangle a carrot lar lar you know, big enough and they'll really do anything and they'll, e they'll, they'll eat this, but we, don't, we won't trust this. And God wants us to trust him to, to weigh into him. To say, yes, I trust that you will do what you said you will do. See, we are a church that is, is full of people who say they believe in God, but they don't believe him in the biblical sense. They don't trust him. We're full of Christians who say they believe in God, but really what they mean is they just agree with Christian propositions. They say they believe in God, but they really just say yes to some Christian ideas. They might say something along this line, these lines. I agree that there is a God, and that God might be Jesus. I agree that Jesus has some teachings that are valuable for us to maybe consider. Maybe we'll, we'll say yes to some and no to others. And I agree that going to church has some value as well. But they don't trust God. They don't put their weight into God. And it's hard for people in the Western society because all of our needs are met with, with, mater with materialists, with, with other material. And so to... To trust God in the things that seem uncomfortable is hard for us. So what we have is a church that say they believe in God, but they functionally act like atheists. They say they're Christians, that they believe in God, but they act like materialists, like naturalists, and they rely on themselves. They trust themselves, but they don't trust their creator God. And so we have to examine this. Do we trust him? Do we place our trust into him? There's this incredible story of David Gibbs. And Dr. David Gibbs is a, is a lawyer. You'll see him up on the screen there. He's a lawyer in, uh, 
in California. He did it for many years. I know it's not a household name, but he has this incredible story of when he was uh, in, in the profession. He had this work to do in Alaska, and of course he had to fly up there. He's from California. And someone approached him and said to him, hey, listen, you don't have to go on the big airline. I have my own plane. I'd love to drive you up, I'd save you a few coin. And uh, what, do you, what do you say? Would you like to come with us? I would come with me, really. And the Holy Spirit started talking to David Gibbs, Dr. David Gibbs, and he said, you know, something's not quite right here. But against his better judgment, he said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll go with you on this, uh, up to Alaska with you. So they're going down the, the runway, and David Gibbs is feeling even more, more uncomfortable, and the Holy Spirit's saying, something's wrong, something's wrong. And he goes to, goes to the pilot, he's like, hey, do you mind if we pray before we go off? And the pilot goes, huh, never done that before. Sure, why not? So they pray. He feels a little better. They, 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 uh, they start flying. Everything seems to be just fine. Until they, oh dear, they come across this, they come across this large cloud system, just very large, and they're getting closer and closer, and the pilot, at the last second, turns to David Gibbs and says, you'll have to fly the plane. I pass out when I, whenever I enter into clouds. <laughs> Passes out right away. So David Gibbs is, is, is freaking out. He's radioing, you know, ground control. Hey, someone help us. Or a pilot uh, passed out. What are we going to do? They eventually get connected to a, a ground control, a ground officer. And the ground officer is saying to them, OK, listen, we, we don't know where you are right now. Let's, we're going to find you on our radar. And as soon as we do, we'll be able to give you instructions on how to get home. It's our job to get you home safely, OK? OK, fine. And uh, a few moments go past, and then the ground control officer connects with them and says, listen, you need to trust me, you need to obey my voice. You are four minutes away from crashing into the mountains. I need you, doesn't matter if you feel like you know what's best for you, if you feel like you can handle things, I need you to listen, I need you to trust, I need you to obey my voice. And of course, he does so, he lands the plane, but the ground control officer stays, stays in communication with him and says, thank you so much for trusting me. Thank you for obeying me. You don't know how many times I've been in this exact same situation and the person figured that they knew better and it ended up in tragedy. Thank you so much that you're here and you trusted my voice. This is a true story. It's not something that preachers make up just to, to look good. It's a true story. And isn't that just true in our, in our own case that we, God, God can see us, but we necessarily can't see him. And he understands what's coming. And when he asks us to obey him and to trust him, oftentimes we go, oh, no, we, we know what's best. We're going to trust in ourselves. So to believe in God is something deeper. Do you know that in the Bible it says this, that even demons believe in God. It says this in, uh, in James 2. It'll come up on your screen here. It says, you believe that there is one God, and you do well. Good job. You, step one, you believe in God. Awesome. Even the demons believe, and what? Tremble. How many of you have seen the first Lion King, the cartoon one, where there's a, there's a scene where the hyenas are talking about Mufasa? Oh, yeah. They say, Mufasa, and the, the hyenas go, whoo, whoo, whoo. They're like, they, Mufasa, Mufasa, whoo, whoo, and they're like, there's this, Mufasa is this powerful beast, has so much authority and so much power that even his name creates the shuddering within the hyenas. And when the demons hear the name of Jehovah, when they hear the name of Jesus, they, whoo, whoo, whoo they shudder. But if you say the name of Jesus and Jehovah and a bunch of Christians, What's our response? Uh-oh. Maybe we have a different relationship. Maybe we need to grow in our trust. We have a relationship with Jesus, and that separates us from the demons, and we need to obey him. This is what Jesus says in John, that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So I'm going to ask you a, a couple of uh, questions here. And they're going to be uncomfortable. And uh, I'm saying this to you to let you know that I'm not trying to be a, uh, a finger-wagging prophet. 
I'm trying to be a loving uh, shepherd to let you know that, hey, there's greener pastures over here. There's some still waters over here for us all to enjoy. And so let's examine ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to, to show us where we need to trust him more, to obey him more. So here's, so here's the questions. Here are the questions. How much do you believe in God if you don't trust him with your sexuality? How much do you believe in God when you don't trust him with your finances? How much do you believe in God when you take it upon yourself to comfort you and not rely on the Holy Spirit, the comforter? How much do you believe in God when he asks you to forgive those people who have hurt you the most deepest, but you decide not to, to forgive them? How much do you believe in God? How much do you trust him? And I know there's this, it's really hard to trust God in these areas. And all of us have fallen into this pattern of faith called the ends justify the sins. The ends justify the sins. We've all fallen to this, okay? And so that means that we think that there's something good that God wants for us. Maybe there's something good that God wants for us. And if there's a little bit of sin in, be in our journey that will get us that good thing, then those sins are justified. For example, in the Bible it says that uh, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Hallelujah. Amen. I found a good thing two years, five months, and 24 days ago. Okay? I found a good thing. But I got to tell you something. I, w I was very tempted to allow the ends to justify my sins. I figured to myself, if I sleep with this person, and then it leads to marriage, then that, the no sins justify the good thing. But that's not what God intends for us. And if we've done that before, then we've fallen for the oldest trick in the book. Here's the book. It's the oldest one. Chapter 3 in Genesis, we have Adam and Eve in paradise. What does paradise look like for you? Costa Rica, Cancun, uh, night at home with the kids, unlimited pizza, like you name it. What's, what's, your, what's paradise for you? They're in, they're in paradise. They can do whatever they want. And in Genesis 3, they, they can do whatever they want except for one thing. And that's to eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. That's it. That's all they got to do. And the, but the serpent was cunning. Satan was cunning. And he comes up to Eve to deceive her. And he says this, Eve, babe, listen. I know you've been homeschooled your whole life, but God is keeping you from university. I don't know why Satan is from Brooklyn, but work with me, people. God doesn't want you knowledgeable or independent. He wants you under his thumb. Don't you know that knowledge is a good thing? Don't you know that God knows all things? Wouldn't you want to be like God? God knows everything. So all you got to do, if you, wanna, if you want a good thing, if you want some knowledge, if you want to be more like God, all you got to do is there's a, this little thing you got to do. It's called sin. But that's okay because you'll get the goods. The ends justify the sins. It's the oldest trick in the book. Is there anything wrong with knowledge? Because it wasn't about knowledge. The tree represented God's authority. The tree represented that God's in control. The tree represented that God is the creator and therefore the designer and knows what it's like to live the way that we ought to live. He knew what was best for us. He has created this container in all these different areas. That's why the commandments are there. You might be sitting there thinking to yourself, man, the commandments are so limiting. You know what? They're not limiting. They're not restrictive. They actually keep you from being enslaved. Some of you here... If you just obey God, to trust and obey, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Those are the very keys that will release you into your, your freedom. And I know it's hard to do this. And I, every time I have conversations about God's commandments, people get really uncomfortable. You know, the church shouldn't be sticking their nose or it don't belong. And we're, and we're not getting into the weeds here. We're not talking about to baptize infants. We're not talking about how many cups we should use in communion, one or a bunch. 
We're not being caught up in the weeds. We're talking about the fundamentals of the Christian faith, to believe in God, to trust in Him, to have a relationship to, to, with Him, and to obey Him. This is so fundamental to our belief. And so maybe you're here right now, and you're thinking, man, this is hard. This feels like it's going to cost me something. And it might cost you something. But it'll cost you everything that you were never designed to have in the first place. Since God has created you, he knows what your destiny should look like. And he knows it'll bring you abundant life. So, how do we learn to, to believe in God more biblically? What's that next area that we need to grow? I have a couple of thoughts for you. And the first one is, is to grow in humility. To approach God with humility. Some of you are sitting here thinking, this guy is just... <laughs> what is this guy talking about? He's, he's just telling me to trust God more. What, I trust God enough, okay? I've got things to worry about on my own. I trust him enough. I'm fine where I am. Thank you very much. Okay. So you're, just, you're exhibiting this thing called pride. And, uh, and I don't know if you know this, but it's the thing that got Satan kicked out of heaven. Not a good look. The Bible says this also, that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When we're pr proudful, when we think that we know how to live our own lives, when we think that we, we got this, God, don't worry, you stay, stay in your lane and I'll stay in mine. We're actively opposing him, and he's opposing us. God doesn't want to oppose you. What does God want to do? Give you grace, and grace abundantly. We need to grow in humility. Second thing I want to draw your attention here, too, is to remind yourself who you belong to. Who do you belong to? Yourself? Do you call the shots? Who is it that out of all of human history decided to put you right here in a place where there's emerging technologies that are kind of scaring people, where there's a supercomputer in everyone's pocket and access to endless cat videos? <laughs> Who decided to do that? It was God's providence to put you there. He knew who you were. He knew your, your strengths and your weaknesses. And he decided to put, put you in this place in human history because he knows it will bring you meaning. He knows that he, you will encounter him. He set it all up. It was him. In Corinthians, it says this. 1 Corinthians, you do not belong to yourself, for, you were, for God brought, bought you with a high price. Jesus bought you. Be Jesus created you, and he put you in this place for a reason. We need to remind ourselves who we belong to. And the last one is this, is to practice the presence of God. Some of you are here, and you're going through a hard time. And this message is really hard for you, and you're resisting it a lot. It's because you're going through a lot of pain. And you're going through um, some the hardest things that life has to throw at you. And for a guy to just say, hey, you need to believe God more, can seem very trite and asinine. What you need, instead of an intellectual argument, instead of some gray-haired guy telling you what to do, you need the presence of Jesus. You need to, you need to practice the, his spending time in his presence. Imagine this. A kid who fell off his bike, toddler fell off his bike, scraped his knees, got some blood, maybe a bruise on his lip, comes up to you and decides to, you're the person who's going to bring him comfort. And you turn to him and you say something like this. Listen, kid, those, uh, those scrapes, they're not infectious, so you'll be fine. That bruise will go away in about, I don't know, a couple of days. The pain will go away in about 20 minutes and you'll forget this whole thing even happened in about three hours. You need to stop your quiet crying and just be grateful you didn't get hit by a bus. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you'd be right, but you'd also be a dingus. <laughs> what do you do instead? You pick up the child. You hold it. You let them know that you love them. And let your presence 
be the healing balm over the pain. The pain that you're going through is not going to be satisfied by an intellectual argument. Because you know that Christians aren't exempt from tragedy. You know it. Christians aren't exempt from all the hardships that life has to throw at us. We aren't exempt. But not what we do have. The presence of the living God is at our disposal and is at our access. And in fact, it's not very hard. He's waiting for you to come to him. Belief in God is incredible. It will rock your world as it rocked mine in grade 10. And Jesus believed in his heavenly father so much that he came down, became a man, and he died on the cross for us, lived a life that we should have lived, and died a death we should have died, so that whoever would believe in him would take upon his righteousness, have eternal life, walk uh, step by step every day of their life with Jesus. And he would, he would give you spiritual gifts so that you could go out and help those that are in darkness and also those people who need to encounter Jesus. That's what he did. Jesus was a brave man, the bravest. And he's calling his church, his bride, this beautiful bride, to be the light of the world, to biblically believe in him, to trust him to be in a relationship with him, to obey his commandments. They'll bring you life abundantly. Let's stand together. If you can do me a favor and bow your head and close your eyes, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus in this moment. And the gospel is this, that you and I are way more messed up than we think we are, but we are loved deeper than you could ever imagine. It might be a bit offensive, but actually it's beautiful. Because your value, your self-worth, doesn't mean you have to be smart, funny, attractive, popular, have some sort of mastery of some, some skill, or you have to have lots of money, or seeing the su- successful. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Your value is already determined on the cross. You just have to allow Jesus to tell you and, to, and for you to believe that your value is already determined. God pay, paid the highest price for you and me. And if we, if we understand that, that's, that's the gospel. And for those people who sense that, and decide to start to follow God and to say, you know what, I'm done doing things my own way. I'm going to start to follow Jesus' way. That's called repentance. And when you repent, guess what? God forgives you. And you're a new creation. Brand new. You may feel like the same old, same old, but you are brand new. You've been born anew. And so I want to give you that opportunity. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus into your life, you, wanted to, you haven't followed him before, or maybe you have but you've slipped away and God has brought you back to this place so that you would hear his voice again saying, come to me. I haven't forgotten about you and I love you. If that's you in this place with everyone's eyes closed and head bowed, I don't want to um, call you forward or single you out, get you to say anything publicly. If that is you, if everyone could respect the anonymity here, that would be great. If that's you, if you could just raise your hand, as soon as I see it, you could put it down again. Anyone would say that? Yeah, I see that hand over there. Yeah, you could put it down. Yeah, I see that hand. You could put it down. I see that hand. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do two prayers. The first prayer, we're going to pray pray all together uh, with the people who accepted Christ into their life today. So please repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus... I know that I'm way more messed up than I think I am. But I also know I'm loved deeper than I could ever imagine. For you died on the cross for me. That I might live a life abundant. God, thank you that you have been so brave Teach me how to believe in you more. 
Forgive me of my sins. Everything I've done to separate myself from you. Help me to run into your arms when I make mistakes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let me pray one more time for the rest of us in this area of belief. God, thank you that uh, you are here in this place and you're calling all of us to believe you more. God, I pray as, as this message has been sent that uh, you would reveal to every one of us this area that we need to trust you more, the area that we need to obey you more in. And God, let that totally change our hearts and our postures towards you. And God, would this place, this church be uh, such a beautiful place where when people come in, they see authentic believers, not perfect believers, but authentic believers going after you. And would this church grow in influence as in result and all the people would grow in influence as a result. Would you bless us as we try to obey you and trust you and believe in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand.